church. Let's go ahead and find a place to sit, stand, whatever suits you, and uh, just prepare our hearts to worship Jesus this morning. Lord, we just thank you for this glorious day, God. We just ask that you would hold off the rain, part the clouds, and let the sun come out. But either way, we've come to worship you, Lord. Yeah. So I pray that your presence would fall on us, gathered here, and only, Lord of all places, God, that you would just be pleased to inhabit the praises of your people, God. God, if there's anything distracting us, anything hindering us from entering in to the throne room of grace, I pray that we would just confess it, come clean, um, just ask you to remove the distractions and just fix our gaze on you this morning. Just thank you, God, that you've made a way, God, that we could come in and know you and worship you and praise you and adore you, God. Would you be magnified in our lives this morning, God? Lord, help us not to take for granted the great privilege that we have to worship the King of kings, the Lord of lords, God Almighty, the creator of everything. In your name, amen. Amen. Stand if you want to and worship with us.
up to God. Sing out.
lavished your love on us, your provision and your kindness. Lord, as we give a tiny fraction back to you, just a nothing, Lord, it's really nothing, but it's our hearts and our willingness to open our hands and say, Lord, it's yours, it's all from you, all the blessings are from you, Lord. We pray that as we do that as an act of faith and as an act of worship, Lord, that you would blame take our meager offerings, Lord, and you would just bless it abundantly for your kingdom, that your gospel would go out, that lives would be changed, Lord, that you would bless the gift and you would bless the giver. So there's a box in the back. There's a box in the back. And if you're listening online, there's a link in the comments.
will come and restore all things, and so too do we, God. Yes. And tell them, would you just fill our hearts with the truth of your gospel? Empower us to be your witnesses. Empower us to become more like you. Prepare us for eternity, God. And God, I just prepare right and ask right now that you prepare our hearts, God, to hear your word and to obey it, to let it sink into our soul, our heart. Bless the word as it go forth. Bless John, God, and the word that you've given him. In your name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Are we on, Marcus? Good morning, all you beautiful people. I don't know about you, but I'm glad for an outdoor service. I got two big reasons. One is we get to see each other face to face, unveiled. <laughs> and behold me, maybe the glory of the Lord's shining through your smiles. And the other one is I only, I'll need, I only need to teach twice, uh, once instead of twice. And at my age, that's more of a challenge to do it twice. You know, Michael, when he introduced me for our last uh, uh, face-to-face service, March 15th, before the close down, he said, you know, we thought we'd give a guest speaker that was older and with not much time left a chance to, uh, to speak. I have since stricken him from the will. His siblings will inherit all the debts instead of him. But I get now to have the opportunity to speak for the first time at our church in an outdoor service. So that's a special thing for me, and to be able to see you all here in a very uh, small scale reminder to me of the Sermon on the Mount. Thinking, you know, we're we're a good crowd here for for our situation. But think about it: Jesus spoke to five thousand men, besides women and children, and he didn't have Marcus helping him do it. I'm thinking, talk about uh, an, an incredible service, uh, Savior who could, who could uh, speak that powerfully and project the truth to an audience that large. We have a wonderful Savior. And of course, we know that for reasons other than that illustration. But to me, that's just a little bit more of a uh, often unnoticed factor that Jesus was uh, a Savior for all seasons and circumstances. So you think you've got big problems in your life? Jesus is bigger. You're going to be okay. And uh, we need to remind ourselves, I need to remind ourselves of that, especially in these crazy times. We've got some visitors here this morning. We're really glad you're here. Uh, for all of you, if you didn't uh, bring a Bible, uh, we have some paperback ones available. And they're, they're going at a really good discount today, absolutely free. But because of the COVID, we don't want you to just borrow them. If you, if you need one, Take it by all means, and then take it home and let it be your gift to, uh, to you from us. Uh, if I can, I'm going to single out a couple of visitors. I know we don't usually do that. Colton, you got somebody over there sitting with you that kind of looks like he might be related to you. Who is rain jacket off? And you say, oh, John, you of little faith. Let's bow together for prayer well, again. Father, we thank you that you're our great God and Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. To save us from our sins, who is even right now at your right hand making intercession for us, preparing a place for us, and physically and visibly coming again to receive us to yourself. We thank you, Lord, for all that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the opportunity we've had with Zach and Jody to lift our praise and gratitude to you for the amazing grace that has visited everyone who will call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And Father, if there's anyone here who has not yet made up their mind about that, we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will say to them, today is the day of salvation for you as well. Father, we pray that your blessing will be upon the ministry of your word to speak to our hearts for such a time as this in the way that we each need to apply it to be all that you meant us to be as your children in these days. In Christ's name, amen.
I had two friends this morning. <laughs> One of them said, I'm waiting for this day. I've never heard you speak yet. And I said, you haven't been through the tribulation yet, huh? And the other one said, oh, I didn't know you were speaking today, otherwise it wouldn't have come. <laughs> it's always nice to have people. God has always given me friends who seem to be appointed to make sure I keep my feet on the ground. Of course, if you're married, your wife, as much as she loves you, will do that too. There was a time when a preacher felt like he really, he was really hitting the ball out of the park. And after the service, they were driving home for, you know, a typical roast beef lunch and stuff. And... Uh, he was really feeling like, boy, I really, I really hit the mark today. But she wasn't saying anything. She's already thinking about, you know, the guests that are going to come. So he starts fishing a little bit. As they're driving home, he says, honey, how many great preachers do you think there are, you know, in the, in the country today? And she's, her mind's way out someplace else. She said, I don't know. He said, no, no, just think about it. You know, what, 12, 15, 20? All of a sudden, she realizes where she's going. She turns around and gives him the eyes. She says, one less than you think there is. <laughs> so I'm not going to lean into anything, anything like that with my wife after today. But uh, God has a sense of humor, and I'm sure glad of that. I certainly need it. I want to open with an illustration. He became the youngest rookie in Major League Baseball at the age of, would you believe, 42 years old? He went on to be an outstanding pitcher known for his uh, exceptional control, and he kept pitching in Major League Baseball until he was 59 years old. And if you know anything about baseball, that's pretty remarkable to keep going at that age. He was an African-American named Satchel Page. Any of you baseball fans recognize that name? Now, admittedly, that was back in the 40s and the 50s, and I had some of you, are, you know, who were too young for that. But he was a remarkable person in terms of not only his baseball ability, uh, and because of his flamboyant personality, in addition to that, he always drew a good crowd. But he was also known for some down-home witticisms that, just stay with me, they're related to what we're going to talk about today in our passage. Uh, witticisms like, if you didn't know how old you were, how old would you be? Think about that for a minute. And he also said, work like you don't need the money, Love like you've never been hurt, and dance like nobody's watching, <laughs> for those of us who know how to do that. My wife still won't dance with me, so I think she thinks I got two left feet. But if Michael ever gets married, she's going to dance with me at the wedding. Is that okay? <laughs> I think probably his favorite of mine is, uh, age is just an attitude of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the older I get, the more I appreciate that. Now you say, okay, Pastor, those are kind of cute little witticisms, but what do they have to do with the Word of God this morning? All three of those examples illustrate something that Satchel was on to, and that is that they all have to do with the importance of the state of your mind. The importance of the state of your mind. Now, that didn't originate with Satchel Page. He recognized what the scriptures already recognized centuries earlier that the state of your mind is very important to your behavior. That's why if we were going to call this, if we had a title for the sermon, we'd say your mind matters or the matters of your mind matter if you want to play with words a little bit. We have passages like be transformed, Romans 12, 2, by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to then, in your behavior, discern what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Or, uh, in, in the idiom of the day, it was understood, gird up the loins of your mind. You think, excuse me? Well, in those days, you picked up the hem of your robe and you girded around your loins when you were getting ready to go. A more modern, go to work. A more modern version would be, prepare your mind for action. Isn't that good? All up here is, is important. It's not all in your head, but it's critical to the way it's going to flesh out in our lives. Or, as Paul said, we bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Enough said about that. The importance, the state of our mind is important to our behavior. And in Philippians chapter 4, our passage begins in, in verse 4 and goes through 8. 
it's going to be centered around the thought in verse 6. Don't be anxious about anything, but instead, and some of you know this, but what? Pray about everything. Yeah, that would be the modern translation. Thank you, Brenton. I think that's the one that really wears well in the 21st century. But with prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then it tells us what will happen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, will stand God in your hearts. But I want to submit to you that as good as those two verses are, 4, 6, and 7, that we don't overlook the context in which those verses are. Because always a passage has a context. And Scripture has unity. And I really think we miss something if we ignore verses 4 and 5 along with that. It, it would be easy for us to read those as say, well, that's all good advice, but they're sort of standalones in a holy grocery list of actions we should take. I want to submit to you that they're all connected to the verse that we just looked at, that they're prefaces to preparing you to be able to cope with anxiety. And that's a state of mind that we're not strangers to, are we? <laughs> Even before all the craziness that we have now started, we've all probably been... Uh, people that if there was a spiritual gift called anxiety, we figured we had it because we're good at it. Somebody would, I know we have the picture uh, of, of a uh, toothy, grinning, red-headed, freckle-faced kid on the front of a magazine that was very, very popular for many years called Mad Magazine. And what was the slogan up there at the top of that where he would have his big, silly grin? What me, what me worry? Remember that? How, uh, how much am I dating myself here? How many of you recognize that expression? Come on, raise your hand. Don't make me feel like I'm on a strange planet. Okay, what? Me worry. Yeah, you say, well, yeah, I'd like to have that sentiment that Alfred E. Newman had, but the truth be told is, if I got paid a dollar for every time I worried, I'd be a rich person today. I think more of us feel that way because it somehow is easy for us to get caught up with worry and anxiety. And, and, and that if we take that word, the Greek word for that there, uh, it, it, it's, it's been translated in King James, be careful or full of care. Don't be, don't be that way about anything. Uh, and, and the word really, I think the way I like to break it down in understanding is uh, don't be caught up with distracting care because it's appropriate for us to be understandably concerned about real issues in our lives, whether they're related to the present crises that we have or just everyday stuff like, how am I going to get to the end of the month and pay the bills and feed my family? Or am I going to be able to get back on the job with full-time work? Because right now, we've been tightening the belt, and beans and rice is just getting kind of old. Those are real, understandable concerns. The difference between concern and anxiety is, are we in control of the concerns, or are they in control of us? That, does it become a distracting thing? And I think that's where we need to understand what we're talking about here. We're not trying to make any of us feel guilty that we're concerned about real things, but who's in charge here? Well, ultimately, God is, but am I in charge of my emotions or are emotions in charge of me? That's what we want to be able to understand the difference about. And that's why I hope to encourage you through the scriptures to make sure that we don't wind up being under our circumstances, whether they're the more common ones or the, the ones that grip us right now. Jesus repeatedly said to his disciples, fear not. And then also in John 14, don't let your heart be troubled. The implication there is that he realizes we have a, a, a strong tendency to, uh, to, to give in to fears and a troubled heart. And as I said, we do have legitimate reasons to be concerned, but his concern is that those things did not grip us and control us. And he is the one who makes all the difference. So what I want to submit to you today is that we look at Philippians chapter 4, but we start with verse 4 and, and consider the fact of how it is related to avoiding anxiety. Because it says what? Rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, that sounds good, doesn't it? But if we know anything about who said it and where he was at the time, it's even more profound. And some of us do know. It's Paul, and where is he when he says that? He's in a Roman prison, or more correctly, a Roman dungeon. And believe me, uh, <laughs> Roman prisons were nothing close to being a country club atmosphere of a minimum security prison. 
we have a minimum security prison in Sheridan, Oregon that doesn't even have fences. The guys can go out there and do a little farming and stuff like that, and it's understood that they're not going to run away. Uh, I don't know how well that works, but that's minimum security. You're not behind barbed wire and all that stuff. And conditions can be pretty good, according to one gal that we know who's worked as a dental hygienist. She said some of the guys in those prisons have better dental care than the average citizen. They're, they're being well taken care of. And I'm not haranguing that. I'm just saying that's not what Paul was dealing with. Whatever you think about the commendable or lack of commendable things to say about that. Uh, and he had every reason, I'm sure, to complain about prison food. Uh, you know, when you go to camp, we sometimes grumble about food, you know. But uh, this is, a, all I'm trying to say is this is not the kind of thing that we would say, well, Paul was pretty well off. He was dealing with circumstances that were pretty adverse. And yet he says earlier, I'm rejoicing over the realization that the gospel is being furthered through my unwelcome circumstances. And I'm, and I'm not only rejoicing, I am now practicing not only what I preach, but I'm urging you to practice what I preach, and that is you rejoice too. And I'm sure that, and we know from the circumstances of the Philippians, that they had reasons to not rejoice because their circumstances weren't always that good uh, at that time particularly. So I want to encourage you and me, as part of a biblical prescription to deal with anxiety, to start by rejoicing, or more specifically, uh, having a positive outlook, if you want to put it that way, counting our blessings, because we have something about which to rejoice. We shared a little bit about that in the opening, uh, the, the prayer that we just had before getting into the message here, that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, that God is a very available help in time of trouble, and, and all of us are dealing with troubles of some kind or another, or we have just recently been through those, and we have good reason to believe there's going to be some more because we're in a fallen world. And, and, and Jesus said, in the world, you're going to have troubles, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I don't know about you, but it's very easy for me to overlook that reality because <laughs> I can get consumed, you know, with the cares of this world, whether they're the common ones or the extraordinary ones. Uh, we... Uh, we could say, yeah, but, but we're, we're dealing with this COVID thing, and we got a lockdown like nothing we've ever had in U.S. history. This is crazy. I, you know, I, I'm going nuts wearing this mask or can't go to meetings or I go to somebody's house, not comfortable with coming in or all kinds of things where we've had to make adjustments if we're going to obey the ordinances of man. Some of the rest of us may feel like I, we need to have these masks. I mean, because if we don't, we're going to be really in trouble. So we've got the whole whole spectrum of anxiety over whether we're doing enough or when are we going to get over doing too much, depending on your point of view, so much so that no matter where you are on the spectrum, we now have a new phrase called caution fatigue. Isn't that interesting? Caution fatigue. I've never heard that one before. But because of these unusual circumstances, we've got unusual dynamics that are going on in terms of our emotional state. It's real, isn't it? So I hope we recognize we're talking about a very relevant issue to our personal well-being in our walk with Christ. And if you're a person here as a visitor and you're not a believer, hopefully you realize there's a lot of relevance to the present life as well as the eternity to come to knowing Jesus. Starting with having a positive outlook because you've got something about which to rejoice. Let, let's start with Let's start with the finances just to get a handle on what we're talking about. And this is not to minimize that some of us may really be struggling with financial issues, but do you still have a roof over your head? Do you still have food, clothing, and shelter? Your diet may have been changed depending on the circumstances you're dealing with because that $1,200 or if you're married, the $2,400 income that came in is probably pretty well dissipated by now, depending on how you manage it. But do we still have things for which to be thankful? that are so easy to take for granted. You know, even, even if you're a poor, even if somebody is a poor person, I'm not saying you or me, but a lot of people that aren't really high in the income level are still better off than most of the world today. And some of us, I suspect, and I don't say this to be critical, even though we may be struggling with the financial situation, may very likely have a large screen TV that we're watching in the evening. And if you're watching the news, I'd say you're better off leaving it off personal opinion. That's not, that's not the uh, church position. 
because we want to deal with anxiety in a constructive way. So counting our blessings or having a positive outlook, I submit to you, is one of the first steps in the prescription for dealing with anxiety in a way that it doesn't grip us. It could be when we look at the uh, uh, situation with, uh, at home, sometimes we have domestic situations in our marriage or with our children that, that can be legitimately of great concern. But do we still have a husband or a wife? Do we still have kids? We, we might be tempted to strangle them sometime and, and, and ship them off to their grandparents permanently, but in the end, we love them. And then when the day comes, they're growing up and they go off to college and get married, we sometimes feel like the house is empty. We're just never happy, are we? <laughs> And, and even though there are, there are times that we would, would like to uh, just uh, kill each other as a husband and wife, I mean, even Billy Graham said, my wife has never considered divorce. But murder, yes. <laughs> there are times. It's not fun. You know, but Jesus is there for us to run to in all of these circumstances. But if you still got a marriage, can you thank God for it? And they say, well, I'm reconsidering. <laughs> Howard Hendricks, who was an outstanding evangelical Christian leader of a previous decade, he says, marriage is like, and he'd say it like this, marriage is like flies on a window pane. Those on the outside want in, and those on the inside want out. <laughs> We've all got something that causes us concern. And I'm not trying to make light of real situation, but God forbid that we ever lose our sense of humor, even in real situations. My wife's father was the director of a home mission program that had roughly 200 different fields across the U.S. and Canada. He took it very seriously. It was his life's work. And he, uh, he, uh, he was readily available to any of those, they called them missionary couples. They didn't want to be pastors who just stayed in their studies. He wanted them to be out in the in the in the in the communities to which they've been planted and go where the people are, go where the fish are. But uh, he never lost his sense of humor, and I think that's why he lasted so long, not just avoiding burnout, but really being a person who loved what he was doing because he never lost his sense of humor. And, and I watched him in his home uh, deal with serious situations when somebody needed to call about some crisis on that particular missionary field or whatever, but he, he was always available, but always never lost his focus that this is, this is God's work, and, and I can still have a sense of humor about the fact that we're all under construction. So when I say this, please don't feel like I'm trying to make light of whatever situations we use to illustrate, but that we don't lose uh, our perspective in the process. In addition to having a positive, oh, oh yeah, the COVID, uh, you know, we could say, well, we got this serious situation. Uh, uh, but we could also decide, do we have something to be rejoicing about in this situation? I think so. In our county of 40,000 people, how many deaths do we have? Zero. How many hospitalizations? Zero. How many cases, most of which are recovering? 52. Out of a population of 40,000 people, you've got one chance in about 800 that you're even going to get it, let alone how, how much it's going to affect you. Now, am I saying it's not real? No, but compared to some other places in the country, we've got a lot to rejoice in and be grateful for. Not brag about, but be grateful for and, and not be gripped by the anxiety that just is bombarding us from the media every day. That we don't let that be the atmosphere that dictates our state of mind, that we're not given to anxiety. We can be concerned, but we don't let the concerns govern us. Get the picture? Okay, and I know that we're at different places on the spectrum, and I'm not here to you know, get into that, but just that we don't forget when we see the glass, yes, it may be half empty, but it's also half full. And we don't want to be given into being negative Christians. Some of, some of us, not here necessarily, but some people, whether they're Christians or not, can become so negative about things that if we make it to heaven, we're going to complain about the altitude. I don't want to be that kind of a Christian, do you? <laughs> so if we can be positive and leave that kind of a legacy in our homes with our fellow Christians and the people that we run into in the community, I think that's one way we can be people of positive distinction for Jesus. We're not ignoring that there's a concern, but we keep it in perspective. And we let the hope that we have in Jesus Christ shine through. Amen? Amen. Okay. 
Second thing, in addition to the positive outlook, this one's, uh, this one can be uncomfortable, is uh, it says, the verse, depending on your translation, it's going to be, let your uh, moderation be known to all men, let your forbearance be known unto all men. Somebody else have a different one? Your gentleness? Yeah. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a tricky Greek word to properly translate, but we can get the gist of it by, uh, by, uh, by recognizing that it involves uh, a consideration for other people. This one is not so much just about my state of mind, but how it's affected by how I interact with other people. Uh, Matthew Arnold, I think it was, he, he's, he was from a different generation, so the language will be different. He, he defined it as sweet reasonableness. How about that? <laughs> we don't usually use that combination here. The, the, the combination that I think is appropriate to use here is patient consideration for others, especially with people with whom we can become impatient. As parents, we can become impatient with our children. The Bible says, particularly the fathers, because I think the tendency is more so with fathers, not an exclusive. Do not uh, provoke your uh, children to anger lest they become discouraged, you know. Uh, the caution that how we, how we treat each other within the home is very important. I am grieved when I have heard more than once uh, from adult Christians, I'm not talking about here, adult Christians who were raised in a home with a Christian parent who was harsh and, and, and depreciating of their child. And I thought, God, help us. When, when, when the Bible says <laughs> we've been forgiven of our sins and he makes us new creation, what business do we have stomping down on our kids? Now, that's not the way to raise a family. And I hope that's not true with any of us, but if some of us need a reminder, please hear that for your own sake and for the welfare of your kids. I'm not, I'm not here to criticize. I'm just saying if it's out there, we don't want to be people who slip into that. And when we're tired and cranky, we can be. Right now, because of the COVID and, and people are more restricted to home, maybe they don't have jobs, we have more bad feelings that are coming out. We've got, we've got professionals who are worried about rising suicide rate, domestic abuse, other things that are counterproductive to not just saving lives. We're, 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 we're destroying people psychologically by not, by not dealing with this other aspect in a way that what we're doing is counterproductive. There is this debate. It goes back and forth. How do we balance all this out? And, and so what we're talking about in terms of patient consideration is a very relevant issue, even among Christians. I have a confession to make. I, not too long ago, didn't practice what I'm preaching to you right now. I had a difference of opinion with a brother who's also a friend of mine, and we got into an area where it's a minefield, how we interpret prophetic passages and how we apply them to our present times. Well, we were both pretty decided in our opinion, and we disagreed. Only I have to confess that I got disagreeable. And I, I came away from that feeling convicted about how I handle it. I felt like, you know, I really shut my brother down. I was, I was abrupt, short, and I, and I, just, I just shut him down. And, and it, was this, it, it was as if God was saying to me, and I was feeling an anxiety of heart because I really felt convicted. Don't you hate it when God convicts you about something? <laughs> and it was, this, it was as if he was saying, you know, John, you didn't handle that very well, did you? And I knew I didn't. And it was as if he could almost be saying, I think you know what you need to do. And I did what I didn't particularly want to do. I picked up the phone, and I called my brother, my friend, to make some amends. And thankfully, my brother was amendable to my making amends. And our, our fellowship has been restored, and we've enjoyed each, each other's company since then. And I'm glad for that. But how much nicer it would have been if I had not failed to show patient consideration to somebody who had a different of opinion and, and avoided becoming, uh, <laughs> I, it's okay to agree, but I didn't have to become disagreeable. Patient consideration, forbearance, sweet reasonableness. If we can maintain that in our homes with our, our spouses, our children, doesn't mean that sometimes you have to say, young man, young woman, if you're a husband, get in here right now, wash your face and come to the table or you're going to bed without supper. I don't know how you do it at home. It's not to say that we don't sometimes have to be giving a stern instruction, but our, our demeanor with our children has that element of gentleness, that we're approachable, 
that we are overall edifying to our, to our family members, be they our spouses or our children, as well as to each other, that we take care of each other. That's the, that's the bottom line there. And, and, I, and I found out that by doing the right thing, that took care of the anxiety issue that was really bugging me. I mean, it, it was a distracting care to me. I was with my wife. We were driving someplace to enjoy the view, and my mind wasn't there. I was just upset about that. And I needed to get it taken care of. I was dealing with anxiety, a, a distracting concern. And then when it took care of it, thank God it was taken care of. What I'm trying to say is it does relate to anxiety when we practice or fail to practice patient consideration of each other. Get the picture. Enough said on that one. The third one, then, is the obvious one, and that's, and that's the one that has to do with the connection about praying instead of being worried. So if, if you enjoy an alliterated outline, which is something I like to do to kind of help keep things in place, we've got a positive outlook, we've got a patient consideration, and this is a prayerful focus. This is the obvious one. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. And it, and it describes prayer in several ways here. You notice that? With prayer and supplication, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. Prayer is being described in three ways there. Prayer in, at the beginning is, is generally recognized to be a general recognition uh, or the importance of a general discipline of praying. I'm not talking about the specific components of prayer, but just prayer in general. Then it breaks it down to the supplication part, which is more defined, uh, and then the request, the specific uh, things that we want to ask God for. Supplication is more the, the plea part of prayer. If we do a study of prayer in Scripture, I think a good acronym to understand a, a balanced prayer life is the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S. There, there, there could be another one that works for you, but I think this is a good one. A for adoration of God. C for confession to him, T for thanksgiving, S for supplication. Which one of those components is in this passage? Is adoration in this passage? Not really. I think it, it could be implied in prayer in general, but it's not specifically there. What about supplication? Obviously, yeah. Thanksgiving, obviously. Petition, well, that's a di little different breakdown from supplication. But in our prayer life, and it, it does... I think two things are important here. One is it doesn't mean every time you pray you have to have the whole scope in there. Uh, but that, that at some way, at some time, in the different applications, we include all those aspects. Sometimes you've only got time for one. Uh, I think I've shared this illustration before, but I think there's some of you who haven't heard it, and it's a very vivid one to me. <coughs> Years ago, I owned the car of my dreams. Now, you've got to go back to the year just after the biblical flood. This is about 19, well, I think that by this time it's about 1968. My wife and I are married, but we're still driving the car in which we dated. Now, you've you got to be older to appreciate the description I'm about to give you this, because some of you are just going to roll your eyes and say, seriously, you thought that was a cool car? This was a navy blue 65 Mustang, four on the floor with a four-barrel Holley carburetor, 289, brake horsepower, which we don't even use anymore, 225. I used to love to stomp on that thing. Yeah, the flesh really came out and go through those gears. <laughs> this one had navy blue body, and here's the part you're either going to love or hate. White tonneau vinyl-coated hardtop. <laughs> it, had, it had little uh, leather imitation texture to it. Stop laughing, Eric. <laughs> hey, we're not done yet. Wire wheels with fake spinners. I mean, it was... Back then, it would have been... We would have described it as a cherry-looking car. Who recognizes the term cherry-looking? Come on, admit your age. God bless you, brother. Wow, Eric, you're a man ahead of your time. That was my car. So one day after dropping my wife off to work in downtown Portland, I'm coming back on what then was Grand Avenue or, yeah, I think it's now called MLK Boulevard. I'm coming to the south end. I'm not too far from the Powell Bridge intersection on the uh, east side of the river. I'm just about to cross over uh, 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 an industrial area, and it's an industrial overpass. And some of you may know right where that is. There's a signal, or was at that time, just before you go into the overpass. And I was young and kind of in a hurry. I was in the right lane, and there was a semi in the lane next to me on the left. And I thought, no sweat. I'll just stomp on it, and I'll pass him and be ahead and not have a monkey, monkey around with this truck. What I apparently failed to notice was a sign prior to that intersection that says, merging right lane. 
Usually that's not a big problem because you can go straight ahead and there's usually a shoulder where you can correct for your oops. But in this situation, I don't remember the details, but this semi must not have been loaded because he didn't have any trouble going off the line. And I realized that uh, the, the overpass was quickly curving to the right. So my merge lane was going away really fast. And all there is to the right of me is not a shoulder, but a narrow sidewalk in a concrete barrier. I have no place to go all of a sudden. I realize I'm here. I'm not ahead of this truck yet. He's moving and closing in on me, and I've got no place to go. Next thing I know, I look out my driver's side window, and it's starting to disintegrate in front of me as I see this wheel just chewing up the side of my car, you know, just a couple of feet away. So I issued this really theologically mature prayer. I said, oh, God, help me, because I thought in the next 10 seconds I was going to be toast. Now, did I go through adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication? Nope. <laughs> I majored on my petition, God help me, and thankfully he did. Now, my car didn't come out of that pretty well. I, I, I got shoved up onto the concrete, and the truck went on 100 yards or so before he realized, oh, there's a funny noise over there on the passenger side of my giant wheel. So he stopped, and I'm sitting there trying to collect my wits, and this guy runs up to me. He was a jewel. He, said, he genuinely said, are you all right? And I think I said, I think you are. He said, yeah, I was on that sidewalk. I thought you were going to take me out. And I'm so glad that didn't happen because that would have really complicated, ruined everybody's day. A little bit later, the tow truck comes, and I'm standing there on the sidewalk watching my car, which is totally demolished on the driver's side, and the hard top is crumbled in on the driver's side. And the guy, he's seen, him, he's seen this kind of thing before. He's just pulling it up on the rack. And all of a sudden, he looks at the sidewalk, sees this guy, this onlooker standing there with blood on his arm and he connects the dots. And then his face changes to shock. He said, you were in there? I said, God answered my prayer. I was very anxious for a few moments, very anxious to the point that I could still remember. But God took care of the, ans the anxiety by my resorting to prayer and him being the faithful God that he is and took care of me. And that, that was just uh, very, very superficial uh, nicks from flying safety glass. The car was a total. We got the insurance money for that, and then we wound up with a, I think it was a 65 Volkswagen that we called Herbie, because that was the time when the Disney movies came out with Herbie. And that was our junior high youth ministry car with which we had a great time and was far better suited to what we were doing than that 65 Mustang would have been for junior high work. So God knew what he was doing. And that was a big anxiety issue for me that was quickly addressed by prayer. May we always have a prayerful focus. And sometimes we're going to have extended situations of anxiety that would give us the opportunity for a more ex extended uh, focus of prayer that we are invited to take with this promise. If we do that, and I think we need to couple the positive outlook, prayerful consideration with the prayerful focus, that the peace of God, and what kind of peace? It passes all understanding. Is going to stand guard in our hearts. And boy, if we are in some times of anxiety-ridden trials and stuff, we need the peace that doesn't make sense humanly that is strong enough to stand guard against the reinvasion of anxiety in our hearts. And I think the last verse that we're going to address, 8, fits into this too. A positive outlook, prayerful consideration, a patient consideration and a prayerful focus, but also a purified thought life. And this is an area that really is getting to be more, I think, of a challenge than ever before. Let's be honest about it. We get bombarded with all kinds of stuff on media platforms that we are, all have today. You can be going on to look for something and something can be shoved in front of your face that you weren't looking for. But now you're tempted to go down that rabbit trail and be looking at something you know you shouldn't be looking at. Uh, pornography has become a multi-billion dollar problem in the United States that affects Christians as well as non-Christians. It, it's a big issue. Philippians 4.8 tells us how we should filter our thoughts, whether it's related to moral stuff or things that generate anger and hatred, uh, animosity between people groups. Uh, when you go on Facebook, you really have to be careful today. 
you can go on Facebook and learn something about some good news or some hard trial that somebody is going through in your circle of friends. You could pray for them. You could write encouraging words. Or you can get caught into a bad discussion about politics and religion where people just wind up throwing verbal hand grenades at each other and nothing's getting done because everybody's planted where they are and they're essentially shouting at each other. And you know what that does to your soul? That's not good. That doesn't fit Philippians 4.8. You say, well, what is Philippians 4.8? We don't know. Well, Philippians 4.8 is pretty specific about what it says. It, it, uh, it uh, gives some very practical ways to say, this is how you need to filter your thoughts. Filtering our thoughts, I think, is a little bit like a filter on our water system. We want to get the toxic impurities out of the flow. Easier said than done, right? <laughs> but in Philippians 4.8, it says, whatever things are, have these qualities, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, I'm using New American Standard here, whatever is of good reputation, if there's any virtue and anything worthy of praise, think on those things. It doesn't always have to be spiritual stuff. That's great. But, you know, if you go on a site that, that shows you the beauty of birds or flowers and stuff like that. Colleen back there, she's a bird watcher. She's smiling. She knows what I'm talking about. Your soul can be edified. And it could be a good antidote for anxiety, right? You go for a walk and see a, maybe a bird species you haven't seen for a while, you know, and it's come back to town. And it kind of blesses your heart, doesn't it? I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I think I already know the answer. When we went to Israel together, uh, she was ready to check off some new birds that you have in Israel. But for some reason, we don't have in Astoria, Oregon. <laughs> that was fun, too. God is a God of beauty, and he's given us the capacity with cones and sensors to see in color the beauty of his flowers, his birds. If you go snorkeling, the incredible fish that you can see off Hawaii, that's no accident. Uh, I understand, I'm not an authority on this, that dogs who have an incredible sense of smell don't have that privilege. They only see in black and white. And, and isn't that something? I, I, haven't, I haven't interviewed any dog to see if that's true, but that's what I'm told. You know? So don't take that for granted, that you have rods and cones that allow you to see in color. That's why when you go into Costco, you've got these big screens with the high-resolution things, and you've got these uh, the colors. I mean, they really make them more vivid than, than life, but it still gives you the picture that what an awesome world of nature in which we live. And I think, how could anybody think this happened by accident. Seriously? <laughs> I'm going off script there. But you know what I'm saying. So a purified thought life is something that will edify your soul and keep you from slipping into the negative, because it's kind of tied in with rejoicing. Uh, it, the negativity, the toxic things, the things that really don't fit what God wants you and I to be focusing on. And it grieves the Holy Spirit, quenches the freedom for him to work in us to flesh out the capacity for us to be more fully conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. You get the picture here? I'm not here to browbeat us. I'm here to say, look, we're dealing with anxiety. How can we be smart and deal with anxiety and be overcomers rather than overcome? That we maintain the big picture of this passage to be people who rejoice with a positive outlook, that we're careful with each other with, with uh, patient consideration, that we go to prayer when we feel like we're being overcome by a situation, and that we practice a purified thought life. And I'm confident that if we do that, we are going to be dealing very constructively with anxiety and be overcomers rather than overcome. Now, some of you may feel like, you know, Pastor, I think it's good words, but, you know, I think I got this. I think I got this. Before you feel like you're like Mary Poppins, practically perfect in every way on this subject, be brave enough to ask somebody who knows you well and loves you, and be honest with them and say, you know, do I have a blind spot here? Am I really the positive person that I think I am? Or do <laughs> I had coffee with the guy, who's, he's an unbeliever. He and his wife always bring up something negative. They're nice people. But it just blew me away when, the, when he said, you know, I, I'm, a very, I'm a very positive person, or a very optimistic person. And I, I turned to him with a, a, a look of shock, because that's how he saw himself. I'm thinking, you know, you need a little reality check here, friend, <laughs> because you're not seeing the blind side that you're dealing with. So if you really want to be honest about where you are on this, 
be willing to be surprised that maybe I have a blind spot in one of these areas. Especially if you think you got it together. Somebody says, he who thinks he stands takes heed lest he fall. Now, I suspect more of us, though, are going to be willing to be honest and say, you know, I'm feeling maybe a little convicted in one or more of these areas. In fact, some of us may feel like, oh, man, I don't know how God's going to get this job done. Let me encourage you. There's a scene in a movie called The Mask of Zorro. How many of you have seen that? Anthony Hopkins, he's the retiring Zorro, and he's undertaken to train a younger replacement for himself in the, in the actor Antonio Banderas. Who, they both do, I think, a great job. So as uh, Anthony Hopkins begins to assess this diamond in the rough and how much work's going to be done, he says to himself, this is going to take a lot of work. <laughs> and I think we need a little humor there, even though it's serious. We may be honest with ourselves and say, Lord, I know you've been a begun a good work in me, but this is going to take a lot of work because I'm not the man I know you want me to be yet or the woman you, you want me to be yet or the boy or the girl. Remember this, he who has begun a good work in you will continue to perfect it till the day of Jesus Christ. He's big enough to take on a lot of work. I mean, let's face it, God demonstrated his love for us when? While we were yet sinners. How bad off could we be? That's when Christ died for us, and then his, his work began there. And, and God finishes what he started. But some of us may feel like, you know, I need that little white button with the, with the blue letters on it that says P B. P, I want to make sure I get it right, G-I-N-F-W-M-Y. Some of you may recognize it. Please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. <laughs> that we don't make excuses for the fact that we have areas to work on, but as we need to give patient consideration to other people, we humbly ask that other people will exhibit patient consideration of us when we fall on our faces in the process of growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because let's face it, po buddies, perfect, right? <laughs> but God is big enough to take on the job. Our job is just to be honest and teachable, and he's going to get it done. And in the process, he's going to help our state of mind to experience the peace that passes all understanding because we're yielded to his spirit and that's basically what he says. All I ask, you just be yielded to me, and I'll take it from here. The question I would just leave with us is, and I say this humbly because I'm a Christian under construction too, is that your heart's desire? That you want to be a person who's not only free from anxiety that can really grip us at times, but that you want to be more fully conformed to the image of Christ? I suspect I know the answer to that. And if you desire prayer about this matter with somebody uh, uh, or anything else that's concerned to you this morning, we're going to have church workers that will be available to pray with you on either side of the platform. After I lead us in prayer and during the closing song, you're invited to feel free to seek one of them out and just share confidentially with them what's on your heart and how you might need some prayer from a brother or sister this morning regarding this or something else that's of concern to you today. The Bible says... We're to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We're all wounded Christians that come together, and this is the way God does his hospital work. And there are no restrictions for so-called non-essential surgery here. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the fact that you're here. You're here in every believer because every believer here is temple of the Holy Spirit. But you're also among us. We pray that through your word, as well as the ministry of worship music, you have been free to already be ministering to our hearts to uh, encourage us or convict us or to enlighten us about decisions we're facing uh, because you're the God for all seasons who knows what each one of us in the privacy of our hearts needs this morning. I thank you, Lord, for every one of these dear people that you love, that I've come to love and appreciate and consider my church family. And we thank you that together, all of us who put our faith in Christ are part of your forever family. And we're on the road to completion. We just want to be people who learn our lessons the easy way and to enjoy the abundant life that Jesus Christ came and promised to give us. So, Father, we just pray as we close today that however each of us needs to hear from the uh, passage that we look, looked at from the Bible, that uh, you'll be able to do what you need to do in each of us to make us whole, 
conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and just that much freer from the all-pervading uh, opportunities to give in to worry and anxiety. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, who is our Savior for all seasons. In his name, amen.
God, we're so thankful that you have adopted us. Yeah. For those who have called upon your name, for those who put our faith and our hope and trust in you, you have adopted us as sons and daughters of the Most High. God, we, I can't even fathom what that fully entails and the privileges and uh, all that is entailed with that, God, uh, that we see in part now, we see dimly, but when we see you, we will see in full. Yeah. We'll be like you. We thank you for that. We thank you, God, that we can cast our cares, fix our eyes on you. God, would you help us this week just to apply this very, very practical passage in Scripture to our lives in dealing with, yes. with everything, with anxieties, with frustrations, with our temperaments. Uh, and just uh, may this, may your Holy Spirit bring to remembrance and, and help us in these things that will just better our lives in general, God, and help our witness to you. Mm -hmm. In your name, amen. Amen.